Um, let's bring in Neil Katyal. Neil. Yeah, I want to return to this point from the dissents about the impact of this decision today on our democracy. And, you know, in response to Chuck, and Chuck's absolutely right, the majority says there'll be case-by-case -case hearings to determine whether something is an official act or not. I just don't think, and I agree here with the dissent, that that's any sort of protection here. We've never needed those kinds of case-by-case -case hearings before. We've always just assumed a president is not above the law. And in these hearings, these case-by-case -case hearings, as Lisa points out, you can't even introduce any evidence of a president's motive, why he was trying to do something, like pressure the Justice Department or do whatever. Um, and there'll be a presumption in favor of the president. As Justice Jackson says, that's just ridiculous. And here's what practically this means. A president, like Donald Trump next year or whoever the president is, can take a blatantly illegal act, slap the label, hey, this is an official act, and write that in the preface to whatever the heck he's doing. And now we're going to have to have hearings and so on before district judges and then appeals uh, to determine whether it's truly an official act or not. And it'll all take place against the backdrop of this Supreme Court decision, which says when you pressure, if you're the president, and you pressure the Justice Department to throw out or to, uh, to impugn an election results where you obviously have the greatest of personal motives, that's, a pers that's not a personal act, that's an official act. So if that's your standard for what is an official act, much else is going to be official. And what does this mean practically? I think it means if you're Joe Biden, if you're a Democrat who's running for the president, your path right now is clear. You have to run against the Supreme Court. You have to run against this decision. This is not America. If you want to make America great again, you got to return to the rule of law. This decision today, unfortunately, is a blueprint on how to end the rule Are of law. Are you arguing adding justices to the Supreme Court? I'm not arguing adding justices. I'm arguing that we need to have justices that are consistent with the rule of law and with the most basic American tradition of which no person is above the law. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, the dissents are right here in saying this really changes the nature so, of our entire government and presidency. Neil, but running against the Supreme Court, these are life appointments. So unless uh, a couple of them uh, decide to, to resign or something happens, uh, you're not going to get another appointment and you might not get one in the next four years. What about... I mean, there is impeachment. That's a possibility for justices. It's a long yeah, shot, no, I'm not but it's a possibility. Anything. Yeah, I'm not saying anything like that. I am saying, though, that I think much attention has to be given to what this decision will do to our separation of powers, to our rule of law, as well as the decisions from last week and Dobbs and the like. Um, this court now seems pretty out of step with mainstream American society. The idea that a president, as president, could pressure his Justice Department into doing certain things to help him in the election and to call that absolutely immune, something that can't be looked at by a court, is, um, you know, I think constitutionally unfathomable and um, a real disservice to what the rule of law is about. Interestingly, on the subject of um, motivation and the, the question of bribery, that example that was brought up, you have a, a disagreement from Justice Barrett. This is in the footnotes on page 32. And she says, arguing that in a bribery prosecution, for instance, it's excluding any mention of the official act associated with the bribe would hamstring the prosecution. So there is some tension even within this majority opinion. Yeah, this this issue of like sort of what evidence could come in, and this came up at oral argument. I'm a little surprised that uh, Chief Justice Roberts goes with a with sort of exclusion here, and he says you can sort of deal with Justice Barrett's concern about evidence by saying you can sort of work around that problem. I, I'm really surprised by that. I, I'd like to just underscore what Neil's saying, which is. Because we, we, the presidency always has a lot of power. There's no question about that. But um, and the, just the way in which Donald Trump talks about, for instance, the use and abuse of the pardon power, is is reason enough to be concerned about who holds that office. This decision today makes it so imperative that the person who holds the office understand the limits on and the and exercises those powers with restraint. Because this. 
the thing that is not dealt with here is the hypothetical that was dealt with in the Court of Appeals about SEAL Team 6. And it is unclear how this, they, they, they actually studiously avoid dealing with that because you could make the argument that that is official conduct. At the very least, presumptively how would, you, how would you make that argument? You'd sit there and say, I have determined as commander in chief that this is necessary. And the way that Judge Pan in the lower court phrased it was, what if the president decides that a political adversary is a threat to democracy and orders the, the killing? That is, in, in, that, and why isn't that now an official act with a presumption of immunity. And you don't remember, you don't look at motive. You can't consider that he's doing it to get rid of his adversary. I want to bring in Melissa Murray, but Chuck, you're, you're, you've got a stone cold face and I really got to, I got to get your opinion. Yeah. So I, I look, Andrew is much smarter than me. Well, so, so is Neil and Maya and uh, Lisa for that matter. But <laughs> I'm worried that... Notice he left me out. <laughs> Did I leave you out? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm then, kidding. I, 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 I concede you, you guys are all very smart and much smarter than I am. But please tell me tell me why you, you have... I sense some discomfort with the, the lengths that this conversation is going to. And I, I want to know why you feel that way. Yeah, it, it strikes me as a little bit odd and perhaps hyperbolic that our you know, successive presidents will become cold-blooded assassins and will try and hide that conduct behind this case. I mean, to Andrew's point, it's only, only, quote unquote, you know, presumptively immune if you do something like that. And it's hard to imagine that a president, even including Mr. Trump, would kill a political rival and then try to hide behind this case. I don't think it offers uh, that much um, that much help to him in the main. In this particular case, it's going to be hard for the prosecution. But if I were the prosecutor in this case, Katie, what I'm starting to do right now is marshal my arguments that very, very few of the things we alleged are core constitutional um, prerogatives of the president, that many of them are private, but not all, to Andrew's earlier point, and that those that are, quote, unquote, official are rebuttable. And that's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. It, so it, you can argue they're actually not official. Correct. And that they're not entitled to immunity. And so does my burden as a prosecutor get more difficult? Absolutely. Have I lost this indictment and this trial? Absolutely not. And so I would tell everyone to take a breath, watch the hearing below, and then reassess. Um, uh, as I promised, I want to bring in Melissa Murray, NYU law professor, MSNBC legal analyst, and former law clerk to then Judge Sonia Sotomayor. Um, Melissa, what are your thoughts? Well, I totally disagree with Chuck. I don't think that this is an opinion that across the board is meant to be a neutral assessment of the scope of presidential power. This is a court that painstakingly went through this indictment and identified certain aspects of that indictment and put a thumb on the scale, essentially, as to whether it should be considered official or unofficial, presumptively subject to note to immunity or subject to immunity going forward. And in doing so, they essentially laid out a map for the district court and for Donald Trump, if he chooses to appeal anything that the district court does about how these things should be decided. Uh, this is a decision written about this former president. It's, again, going to have real ramifications going forward. But I think Neil is exactly right. It is about an imperial court constructing an imperial presidency. And Joe Biden should be running on that. And that doesn't necessarily mean, Katie, that it should be about court reform, but it should be about a court that has consistently arrogated power to itself and now is arrogating power to someone who poses a threat to democracy. And this decision poses a threat to democracy, just as the dissent said. I want to point your attention to one aspect here where they specifically talk about the allegations involving Donald Trump's conversations with Mike Pence, where Donald Trump allegedly tried to get Mike Pence to intervene to stop the certification of the Electoral College. The opinion says that whenever the president and vice president discuss their official responsibilities, they are engaging in official conduct. That is presumptively official. And the burden then is on the government to disprove that it's outside of the scope of official conduct. That totally hamstrings the government. It's also the case here that the opinion suggests that conduct that is outside of the scope, um, that is not subject to prosecution, cannot be used to, as evidence to establish that other conduct that is within the scope of prosecution has happened. So that also hamstrings the government. So 
this is a decision I think it would be hard to sort of say is just about the presidency full stop. It's about the presidency of Donald Trump and about allowing him to go forward and escape accountability for the actions that took place on January 6th. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.